Hello, I'm Karen and in today's video I'm going to be sharing with you how to make my um, V-shaped curtain tie back. I've chosen the smaller one to show you actually at the beginning of the video because it fitted nicely into the actual area that I've in my recording space. But I'm actually going to make um, a bigger one because um, the, the bigger one fits better with the story that I've got to be able to tell you today, okay? So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly share with you how easy the actual pattern is. The pattern's actually going to be written in the description box below. But the, the way that this one works is we're obviously going to make a V-shape. And we need to have a chain in here um, to be able to work three stitches. And we need an extra chain at the beginning of our work to be because I'm going to work a single crochet and I want my um, sides to be equal okay so I'm going to need a total of 30 plus this one here so that's um, sorry two thirties is 60 plus the one plus the two so we've got a total of 62 chains to begin with to work out the sequence of our pattern okay so the instructions are going to be in the description box below what I'm going to do is I'm going to be working with um, the pink, which is a Bonnie Babe yarn. I'm actually using a number five crochet hook. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with the pattern. I'm going to work the, the first two rows, well, the chain and the first actual, the first row. Um, and then once I've actually got going after that, I'm actually going to be discussing some more of my history, which today is going to be carrying on from my last video with some more evidence okay so we're going to begin with a slip stitch to start off with <clears throat> and we need to do our chain of 62 so that's one two three four sorry just need to move my notes four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Just getting some more yarn. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, <clears throat> 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, and 62. Okay, <clears throat> now for this one, what we need to do now is we need to skip the very first chain, which is the loops directly underneath the hook. We're working underneath one loop and we're just going to single crochet um, in the next 30 chains. Okay, so that was one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, just getting some more yarn, 20, 
26, 27, 28, 29 and 30. Into the next chain, still underneath one loop, we're going to work three half double crochet. So that's one, two and three. And now we need to single crochet up the, the rest of our chain, which should have 30. <clears throat> Sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight. I'm just getting myself some more yarn. It's in a. It's. I'm working from the outside of a ball today, um. So it's dancing around a bit in a bowl, right? So that was eight. <clears throat> Sorry. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 and 30. Okay, now what we need to do is we need to chain one and turn. And now we're going to work single crochet in all of the single crochet stitches. We don't need to count anymore. But in the middle of the half double crochet, we need um, the, the three half double crochet, we need to do another three half double crochet. So um, now we're working this way, this is actually the back of our work. Okay, so if you are just going to go and read the instructions, make sure you remember that you need to use, look out for the loops. Where I say using the back two loops, it's these two and the front two loops are those two. <clears throat> Uh, so what I'm going to do now is, is in my last video I was showing um, how I um, could prove that the Voynich manuscript belonged to the royal family. And um, according to the, um, the information on who owned it, the very first recorded person of owning it was Rudolf II. Okay, which he didn't own it until around about 1572. And as the manuscript was made in 1438, at the very latest, I needed to work out how did it manage to leave the royal family. So <clears throat> what I did is I looked at the forensic report and I compared the forensic report to actual historical events so that I can actually explain with you um, how I came to my conclusions. So in the... Um, Forensic report, we've got information which tells you that Azurite is the blue, red ochre um, is obviously the red, the green was a copper pigment, iron gold was used to write it, um, and the same recipe was used throughout when making the inks and the colours. It was high quality calf skin, a feather, qu a feather quill pen was used to write it. Originally, it had um, a tanned leather outer cover with a wooden case on the outside of that and the wood got woodworm and that it was recovered at the time that it was actually at the Roman Catholic College with a goatskin um, on the outside of it in approximately 1551. 
Um, when it was rebound, it was rebound in the wrong order. And pages um, was actually deliberately cut out after it was rebound. Okay, now just coming up to the, um, to the corner. So what we need to do is, because this is the back of the work, we want this little loop here to be at the back. So we need to work in the front two loops at this point. So we're going to just do one single crochet here. And then underneath these front two loops, we're going to work our three half double crochet. That's one, two, and three. And now we need to work our single crochet again, but remember underneath the front two loops of the half double crochet stitches, and then we're back into the single crochet, which is, so we're just going to single crochet all the way to the end now. So when I actually looked at the, um, what's it, we've looked at the, the forensic reports, we've got um, azurite blue. Azurite is a mineral, <clears throat> which is, it's sort of like a little crystal kind of thing, and its shade is royal blue. The red okra, we know that was used in the, um, you know, in the, with the caveman paintings and also in the papyrus scrolls. An iron gall ink is made from an iron gall, which is a, it's a little tiny ball, like a little tiny apple that grows on the oak tree. And it's actually, um, it's actually made because a wasp lays its egg inside there the, the gall grows and the, the little tiny grub grows inside the gall and then when it turns into a wasp it flies away and then you've just got this ball left behind which they used to make the ink out of um and the say so the azurite blue that was um the way you get that crystal from you mine that from copper mines and um it's actually naturally occurring in egypt even though it does occur in other mines it does it's the information provided said that it was um, a common find in Egypt. So, and um, because we know it's got high quality calfskin, we know that the manuscript itself was really, really expensive. And um, one of the things that I noted inside it was that there's actually an image of a little dragon. And the dragon, actually, I was thinking it was to do with whales. Um, there's another significance for this, because. If we go back in time and we have a look, who, because Rudolf II was a Holy Roman Emperor. And so it just made sense that, you know, like with the royal family, because the Holy Roman Emperors do the same thing. It sort of follows down in the family tree. So I worked backwards to go and see who was on, who was the Holy Roman Emperor at the same time that the manuscript was written. And his name was Sigmund, Sigismund. Um, and Sigismund actually created the dragon order which was an order against um to fight against christianity and because i know that king henry the sixth was on the throne at the same time it made me wonder whether king henry was actually doubting whether he wanted to be a roman catholic and perhaps be a christian instead so i had a good look at king henry the sixth okay i'm just coming to the end so what i'll do is i'll explain this bit when we've come to the end, we need to go underneath two strands at the end there to complete our single crochet. Now we need to chain one and turn again. Okay, and we're working a single crochet again now. So King Henry, um, he, he inherited the throne when he was eight months old when his dad died. When he was seven years old, he was officially crowned the king and at seven years old is also the same time that Joan of Arc decides to have her war against him. And King Henry VI is a very peaceful man, so he agrees with, um, you know, like little, they have agreements. Rather than fighting, he, he makes agreements over what is fair. And the only person left in his life, um, <clears throat> sorry, at 17, sorry, his mum dies. And so the only person he's actually got left in his life who is, um, has been there that is known all the time is his priest. And his priest is also his half-uncle. And his priest... Um, his half uncle becomes a bishop and then later on a cardinal, so they're still from the um, Roman Catholics. And um, at a certain point, they know that obviously the um, the half uncle is actually going to 
he's going to die so his job's going to finish and um they what they do is they introduce the new man that's going to take over his position and his name is William Wainfleet and um, I look at this and William Wainfleet is is right from um, the 1440s right up until his death um, is his priest so like he knows him for a long long time there's a, it was obviously he's done all of his confessions and um, his mass and he's read the bible and everything while he's been with this William Wainfleet and um, and then what happens is, is that what I did is I thought, well, I need to research this, William, um, you know, find, find out more about this priest, you know, what is he? And as it happens, it's actually been recorded that, um, the Vatican, which is the, the Pope, the Vatican archives actually suggest that William Wainfleet was actually an agent. Okay, and now I've already said to you before, I've got a little James Bond thing going on with my secret service. And now it seems that we actually have a spy who's a priest or a priest who's a spy, whichever way around you want to look at it. But essentially, it means that the Roman Catholics are actually spying on the royal family. And I was a little bit dubious about this because I didn't want to think that the Roman Catholics would do that. But, you know, I'm, I've got to keep an open mind with all of my research. I'm not going to be discriminating. And even if you are um, of the religious side of things, I know you're not going to want to believe this, but we have to accept the evidence as it's given to us. Right, now I'm at the corner, so I'm going to work underneath the front two stitches because I'm back at the front of my work. So I want to work one single crochet there. And under these front two strands I'm going to do three half double crochet one two and three now we're going to work single crochet again underneath the front two stitches of these two loops and then we're just going to single crochet into our single crochet so anyway then when I have a, uh, I've looked at the historical events I then found out that um, towards the end of King Henry's reign, um, he ends up in a battle with Richard, the Duke of York, and um, Henry's son dies, Richard, the um, Duke of York, dies, and Richard's son, Edward IV, claims the throne as his. Um, he's got direct links because of um, being royally related anyway to the throne. And um, William Wainfleet, who is King Henry's priest, he decides to flee the country and go to Ireland. He gets captured on that journey by the French fleet, which I'm assuming is a boat. And um, King Edward pays a massive ransom, which is like well over a year's worth of wages for a priest to be able to get the priest to be free. So then that made me think then, it's like, well, you know, he's paying a ransom to get this priest and this priest is actually supposed to be a spy. You know, this priest obviously is, he knows something. Um, but did King, did King Edward know that he was a spy? And I don't think he did. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> um, through the twist and turn of events, King Henry temporarily gets the throne given back to him. So... William tries to go back to being King Henry's priest, but he's already been King Edward's priest. And um, King Henry refuses to speak to him. So you definitely know there's something not right there. And you can see that, that he quite clearly, after over 20 years worth of friendship, has just found out that this man is untrustworthy. And so, um, and then as it happens... Um, King Edward gets the throne back and King Henry is actually murdered while he's actually um, imprisoned in the Tower of London. So I did have my suspicions and so I thought, OK, then I have to carry on and I have to look at the rest of the royal family to find out what's been going off. Um, and I'll tell you in a minute because we're just coming to the end of this and we need to do a chain of ten to be able to do our loop, to be able to hold the curtain tie back. back. <laughs> that made sense. Um, and do the last one there. 
So we need to chain 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go into the loop where that was our beginning chain and now we're going to work underneath that chain and we're going to work underneath two loops all the way back down. We're just going to slip stitch all the way, all the way right around, right up until we get to the other side and then we're going to make some more, another chain and then come back to this point, okay? So where have I got to? Oh yes. Right, so I started to have a look at my uh, my other kings and queens. And King Henry VIII is known that he actually, um, he broke away from the Catholic Church and he actually became a Protestant. And the reason it says is because he um, wasn't allowed his divorce. Now, I'm not being funny, King Henry had already killed lots of his wives already, so he could have just easily have gone and killed another wife. So why was the a uh, big issue about this? I couldn't find out with King Henry VIII, so I then moved on. And then when I get to um, Queen Mary I, this is where things then took another twist of turns because Queen Mary I actually goes back to being a Roman Catholic. And she marries Philip II. And Philip II is actually Rudolf II, the Holy, um, the Holy Roman Emperor's uncle. So I was like, oh, and that makes things different, you see. But I still know that the um, manuscript had to have left before that point because once Rudolf had got the book, the book has actually already been recovered, okay, because of the dates that the forensic report gave me. So... I know that it wasn't Queen Mary and um, Philip II who actually did give him the book. So, um, but then um, we then move on and we then get to Queen Elizabeth I. Now, Queen Elizabeth I, as soon as she becomes on the throne, she says, that's it, I'm going to be a Protestant, the whole country has to be Protestant, we're not going to be Roman Catholics anymore. And also, if you remember from my earlier um, points of my historical work, um, I did say to you that there was a man called William Lee who invented the um, framework knitting machine and he asked for a patent from the Queen. She says no, he adapts his device and she still says no. And I did have my suspicions at that time as that she knew something about um, crochet and she knew something about you know the patenting, which was a reason for us to say no. I've now found out what the reason was. Um, first of all, the actual machine, um, because it said it was a knitting machine, they actually used what was called a bearded needle. And the bearded needle is actually a hook. It's not a needle. Okay, so effectively, that meant that the knitting machine was actually a crocheting machine. Also, I then found out that William Lee was actually friends with George Brooke and Sir Walter Riley and they was both conspiring against the Queen because they wanted the Queen to go back to being Roman Catholic and I say George George Brooke he was actually a reverend as well I mean they've all got they've all gone through a lot of educational stuff and and things and it seems to be um you know when you think about it quite harsh they tried to make them become Roman Catholics again but anyway, as the turns of events happen, Queen Elizabeth dies and um, William, with his um, framework knitting machine, he goes to France and um, Sir George Brooke and Sir Walter Riley actually then decide that they're actually going to um, kidnap King um, James before he becomes king and make James become a Catholic before he's crowned the king. They get caught out, they get um, tried for treason and they're both killed. And then not long after James is on the throne, Guy Fawkes comes along. He tries to blow up Parliament because he's trying to make the Parliament, make the royal family go back to being Roman Catholics. So um, this sorts of these sorts of events carry on right up until um, we get to 
King William III and Queen Mary II in um, 1689. So for a period of 267 years at least, the royal family was swapping and changing. One time there was, there was Roman Catholics, the next time there was Protestant. And it was going backwards and forwards until um, King William III and Queen Mary II was on the throne as a joint um, brother and sister um, scenario. When they come on the throne, immediately, as soon as they're on the throne, they go to the members of parliament and a law is passed so that um, all of the royal family, it's, it, was it, so no Catholic is allowed to be on the throne of England. Okay? And so... I thought, well, there's obviously got something wrong here. You know, it's like, why is it that the, the royals was determined not to be Roman Catholics? And why did the Vatican use spies to spy on the royal family? And the only explanations that I can give for, for those is to say that they was either A, being greedy, and that they was doing it for money. Um, they could possibly have been blackmailing the royal family. Um... But say with the confession, the confession means that they get to know all of the royal secrets. So, for example, um, just before or actually when um, King Henry VIII comes on the throne is when um, the pencil, you know, the lead that's inside your pencil. It's not really lead. It's called it's a graphite. Well, that was discovered in England. And. Um, and while King Henry VI was actually on the throne was when um, they actually invented the printing press. And the printing press was invented before we had a pencil, before we had even had like a, um, a, a modern style pen. We just need to chain 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go underneath two strands and slip stitch all the way back to the other loop. And then we're going to fasten off. Okay, so, so when I look at this historically, it shows us that the royal family didn't want to be Roman Catholics. So obviously that was because the Roman Catholics was, say, they was um, possibly pinching their ideas or wanted to be the first with their ideas. Possibly they was using some form of blackmail, um, maybe even like just trying to get more money out of them. That I don't know because obviously that those sorts of things aren't documented like that. So it, realistically, it just has to be a theory. But the theory does fit of how the manuscript has a possibility of leaving the royal family. It can get woodworm while it's on the boat because when um, William was actually trying to go to Ireland... It was common that the boats in the 1400s had got woodworm. So the book could have picked up the woodworm then. Then they take it, um, he gives it to, um, see, this is where I thought, well, well, how does it get from William to um, the Holy Roman Emperors? And this is where I think, you know, like with super spies, what they do is they pass on to somebody else. But I do know that in um, 1469, while William was actually being the priest to King Edward IV, the Pope actually gives William a pardon. Now, it's just listed as a pardon, it doesn't give you a reason. And normally, with the Catholic religion, the, what happens is, is that they, the Pope is not allowed to name a person and their crime together. So he can name a person and their sin, but not a person and a crime. See, a crime is different. So it made me wonder, was actually William uh, responsible for murdering King Henry VI? Now, obviously, it is something that I'm never, ever going to know. But historically, we can see how it's possible that the book actually left the royal household through a spy, then goes to the Pope. The Pope is in charge of the Holy Roman Emperors. And then he passes on the book to those. They create special orders to make sure that they try and keep the royal family from becoming Christians. And I say the only reason, the only difference really 
um, well, they actually was Protestants actually at that time. And the only difference really was whether they actually went to confession or not. Because a Roman Catholic does go to confession and none of the other religions do. So, it, I mean, I could be completely wrong, but I could also be completely right. And because of the evidence that I'd got before me and because I can see that from 1689 to the current day, the royal family still doesn't, um, they're not allowed to have um, a Roman uh, Catholic to be on the throne. So maybe this was one of the very first times, you know, like when I said to you before that Queen Victoria actually, she was trying to find out whether she could trust the press, in which she proved that she couldn't. And maybe this was where the royal family knew they couldn't trust the Roman Catholics completely because they kept pinching their ideas. And, um, or there was, you know, like I say, they could have been blackmailing them to use their ideas and their inventions. Um, obviously, I'm not saying that that's about the, the, how the Roman Catholics are today, and when, when we were talking about hundreds of years ago. But it does mean, though, that if this was true, and that William um, did commit this crime, and that the Roman Catholics were actually being um, offered criminals at that time, and, and the Roman Catholics' rule is that if you've done a sin then you've got to do a penance, is what they call it, and it has to be seven times worth um, the crime. So I was like, I wasn't quite sure of like how many crimes have actually happened. So what I did is I thought, well, okay, I know that this has been going on for approximately 267 years, because it went from 420, 1400, sorry, in 22, right up until 1689. So for 267 years, it is quite possible that the Roman Catholics had some form of hold over the royal family. And um, if you times the 267 years by seven, you actually get 1,869. So if they were um, guilty at that time, then that, that meant that they'd got to do 1,869 years worth of penance. I don't know what they actually do for penance, whether they're, like, they're, they're praying and things like this, or I'm not quite sure because I didn't go that far. But um, essentially, what this did is this just showed me how it was possible to be able to take something from the royal family. And um, it wasn't a very nice thing to do if they did do that. And um, they say for this, um, it, it was a crochet, but then... Because I haven't translated all of it, I'm not quite sure whether there's actually other little bits that are secrets. And also, what I am allowed to see of the actual book on the internet is not actually exactly the same as what is in the book. Because when I, um, obviously I read the forensic report, but I actually went and watched a video about the forensic report. And so you, I actually got to see more of the book through watching that. And um, all the evidence that they've done, all the different ways that they've tried to um, decipher the codes inside the book and everything, are fascinating. But they haven't done the same sort of journey as me, whereas I've been actually looking at the characters around at that time, what were they doing, and came to the conclusion that I have done. I say that the manuscript actually was originally in the royal family and was taken by William and then passed on i've pulled that a bit tight look i made myself a little bit of a hole there i'm trying to pull it back um and so then it was passed on through the holy roman emperors and um the evidence that they had that they said that um they said that there was um what was it jacob tepence there was actually a signature by him inside the book that then got deleted or erased and he just happened to be the doctor who was the doctor for Rudolf the second and because he was the doctor for Rudolf the second and Rudolf the second was the nephew of 
Philip II, you can see that he actually the doctor actually also had access to the royals. So um, it could have, um, I say, well, I, I thought it could have been possible that um, it was taken while Queen Mary was on the throne, but then obviously the forensic report shows that it was taken earlier. And the earliest event that I can find, like I said, is with, there we go, look at that. It's lovely. <laughs> um, I'll V-shaped, I'll put it sideways so you can see it. Actually, it looks more like a wishbone like that, doesn't it? I never noticed it when I was uh, putting it that way around. It can have like a wishbone shape or even like a bishop's hat, even. Oh, V for the Vatican, V for the Voynich Manuscript, V for Queen Victoria. <laughs> So anyway, there you have it. That is my latest bit of information to add on to my historical evidence. And in my next video, I'm planning on sharing um, a beautiful pattern that I've learned how to do. Let me just see if I can reach it over. And you have a look. And there we go. I've actually made the flower of life. Um, and it's correct, it's actually correct, for, like starts off with like a little flower, it's all made up of flowers and actually makes a hexagonal shape on the outside. Um, so I hope that you'll carry on um, having some faith with me and my crochet, because I do have, say, I do have some absolutely beautiful patterns. And today's history, obviously, it, um, is all about V. I um, <laughs> um, hope you make these lovely tie backs, they're really, really great. And... Now we've just got some more evidence to add on to like this little story of how the twists and turns have happened, of how the royal family, I'm saying I'm convinced that the royal family are the ones, but as yet, nobody's actually said anything or been in touch with me or um, anything like that. I don't know whether I'm supposed to write to somebody and say, um, hey, I think I've discovered what this is, but um, I've got more discoveries to share yet, so maybe they're waiting until I've shared them all, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but yes, I've got some interesting things to share with you. Um, so on this one, I'm going to discuss Penelope and um, actually going to discuss the pencil as well, I think, on that one. And also I'll probably, because it's, um, I'll just chit chat, I suppose, as I go along. But um, so for now, I want to thank you for watching. Thank you for liking. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for subscribing. Um, I do hope, see, it's like if you make these in different sizes, you can actually make them all line up nicely. I mean, these ones, obviously, they don't fit together. But you can make yourself some beautiful patterns. Um, I've lost my little flower. You can add on your little flowers to make them a little bit more feminine. Or you can keep them um, just plain and simple. It's entirely up to you. So thank you for watching. Thank you for liking. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for all your lovely, lovely comments. I do read all of these things. Um, I just really don't ha actually manage to be able to have the time. Um... To be able to reply to everybody and i think if i reply to some then others are going to get um upset that i haven't replied to them and i'm like oh so maybe i'll have a day of like just literally replying to everybody so thanks again bye for now